All right. So um, those of you who know me know that uh, I prefer to talk to people and not at people, which is why the lights are up right now. So I'm going to take you through some of our uh, criticisms of this paper. And what I would really like is to make sure that you understand it. It's no good if I'm just talking at you. So at any point, you know, raise your hand and we can, we can have a discussion about it. But first, to give you sort of the background of, I don't know where I can. Okay, so this is the paper, this is the paper um, that we're talking about. Uh, when it came out a few months ago, um, the animal rights activists took it and ran with it. There were lots of headlines, there was lots of social media um, saying that, hey, we've got this peer-reviewed paper that is now showing that uh, killer whales in human care um, don't live as long as those in the wild. And so what I want to talk about today, well, is that true, right? Is what they're saying true? No! <laughs> What you've got here is bad science. And I don't say that lightly. As, as a scientist, when you're talking about a peer-reviewed paper, like, like Gray said, it means something. But what does it mean? Next, please. Peer review, I think, is this daunting thing for most of us. It is for me still. And for those of you who haven't been through the peer review process, understand that it is a long, methodical process. And, and I think Kelly is, is one that's going to talk about the process today. Uh, science is meant to be fundamentally slow and laborious and take time because it's over the course of months and years, decades, centuries, where our understanding is increased. But that isn't meant to be done on this 24-hour news cycle that we live in today. And so, unfortunately, that same peer review process, of which we both you know, respect and love, doesn't necessarily help us on the communication side of things. So, Jet and Ventry's paper has been out since spring. It's got traction because it's, it was first. And how many of you went to the IMATA conference last year and might have seen Mike Scarpuzzi's paper on orca survivability? That was a very lengthy paper, but it just got published and printed about two months ago. And so you might have great data today, but it could take months or years before it actually gets in print. And that's one of the reasons why we're here today is to kind of circumvent the communication process because our rebuttal has been peer reviewed. We spent all summer working with our co-authors, which by the way, we should mention Kevin Willis and also Dr. Todd Robeck, who are our co-authors on this rebuttal that we're presenting you the kind of cliff notes today. Okay, keep, keep that slide for a minute. How many of you have ever submitted a paper to a peer reviewed journal? Raise your hands. Okay, how many of you have not? Okay. And in that case, I want, I, that, that's what I thought, and so I want to take a minute and sort of walk you through that so that you know what that means. When uh, a piece of science is ready to go out, um, you do all the things that you need to do, the statistics, this and that, you write it up and you send it into a journal. The editor um, either takes it himself or assigns an assistant editor who then farms it out to a few reviewers. It is the editor's discretion what reviewers to send it to. Those reviewers can either decide to review it or not. Um, and then usually three reviewers, sometimes two, sometimes whatever, but, but usually three reviewers uh, independently look at this, send their comments back to the editor, criticizing it, um, and saying what their recommendation is for whether or not it should be published. And then it is up to the editor to decide, to compile all that and decide whether or not it should be published. It's a good process, um, and it, it, it means that a lot of crap isn't published. However, it's not an infallible process. There is still lots of room for interpretation. So the editor, and I, I don't know what happened in this particular case, but there are lots of places where bias or sloppiness or anything else can slip through. The editor can choose to send it to people who have a particular orientation. Not saying that happened, but it certainly could happen. Um, it could be that certain people um, decide not to review it, even if they're qualified, because they don't want to throw their hats in the ring. It could be that certain people are then asked to review it, and it's not in their field, but they have an opinion about it, so they say that, that they want to review it. It could be they're very busy, and so they didn't read you know, as, as carefully as they should. There are lots of places for mistakes, and sometimes things that shouldn't get published do get published, and I believe that this is one of those things. The errors in it that we're going to talk about are so basic and so fundamental, but the problem is it's a very dense paper in terms of statistics. So most people are not going to go through and read it. They're going to read the headlines, all right? 
So in any case, just because something is peer reviewed doesn't mean that it is written in stone. In fact, what will often happen in science is a paper is peer reviewed, it's put out there, another uh, group of scientists says, well, no, I don't believe that, and then they, they do another paper. And that's sort of what Gray was talking about. Science is a process. The scientific record will eventually converge on a more right answer, but in the meantime, the media has already taken this, right? Which is why we need to talk about it. Okay. So I want to talk about um, three different huge mistakes in this paper. One is inappropriate handling of data sets. And let me, let me give you sort of a, a feel for it. Let's suppose you're going to compare two groups of people, this side of the room and that side of the room, on something like height. Now, however it is I decide to do it, the important thing is I use the same rules for both groups, right? So what I could do instead, click please, I could say, well, you know, some of you are shorter than others of you. I take Let's, exception to that. Hey. <laughs> it wasn't a value judgment, it's just it is true. Some of you are shorter. So maybe what sh we should do, click, is on this side of the room, we're not going to count anybody that's under 5'6. Okay? I really take exception to that. <laughs> But this side of the room, we are going to count that. And if we did that, that, of course, is bad science. You can't just do that and then say, all right, now we're going to compare heights on this side, not including the short ones, right, and height on this side, and, and act like that's a real comparison. But that's exactly what they did. And let me explain why. All right, so the, the blue ones here are uh, orcas in the wild. And the way that uh, the field studies work in the wild is the field season doesn't typically happen until approximately six months after the calving season, right? So that means that when they first see a calf, it's about six months old, which means that if a calf dies before six months old, they never see it, right? Does that make sense? Because this is really important. If a calf dies in the wild before about six months, it is not seen, it is not counted. So they can't count calves that are under six months. However, and, and remember that Jet and Ventry know this. They know this. And they also know that the mortality rate is estimated and agreed upon by pro and anti-zoo fans to be around 50%, give or take. Right. This is not like a little tiny tweaking thing. This is a huge deal. Click for me. Right? But in human care, we of course know from birth. And so what they did is they said, all right, so for the ones in human care, we're going to count them from birth. If they die at three months, we're going to count that. The one in the wild, if it dies at three months, we're not counting that because we never knew about it. Right? You can't do that. They know you can't do that, and they did it anyway. Okay? All right. Everyone get that? Any questions? Cool. All right. Next, separately from that, um, they make some bizarre invalid comparisons. Click for me. So one of the things they say is, look, among female killer whales, in the wild, these are two statistics that they show you, in the wild, 41 to 75% reach age 40. And they compare that and they say, well, in marine mammal facilities, only 7% of those currently living are greater than age 40. And they look at that and they say, oh my god, look, you're talking about 41 to 75% versus 7%? That's horrible. Except they're completely different things. And let me explain why. Click, please. The first one we're talking about survival probability. What's the probability that a given animal will reach age 40? The second one we're talking about is population structure. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain a little bit more, but this is current, how many of them are above age 40? This is not the same thing, and I can prove it to you. So now we're looking at a population, right? And you've got 10% of the population is above age 40. Suppose we have an influx of births, right? Now, all of a sudden, less than 10% are above age 40, right? Click for me. Population structure has changed. However, click again, survival probability hasn't changed at all. We didn't talk about any deaths. These are completely different things. Just because you're using the word percent in both doesn't mean you're measuring the same thing. You're not. Okay. Click. And the take home here is, 7% above age 40 does not mean that 93% of them died before age 40. It just means they're not old enough yet. And yet if you it's read the paper, you come away with exactly the opposite of that. All right. Everyone good? All right. Third, unsupported conclusions. I love this one. Click. See, I learned. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so again, let's, let's go with height. 
just because it's, it's easy. If we were to measure height in a population, ideally the data would look something like this, where you have a few people who are shorter, a whole lot in the middle, and then a few people on the end. However, real world data, click, is bumpy. Any scientist will tell you that. Real world data is not the same as ideal data, but there, there, there are bumps in it. Click for me. So here's the question. When you see these bumps, is it a real effect? There is something going on there, a, a statistically valid effect, or is it just random variation? To tell the difference there, click for me, that's why we need statistics. Anybody who wonders why we need statistics, that's why. When you see these bumps, are we looking at a real result, or is it just random variation? If you flip a coin a hundred times, there is going to be a point in there when you get five heads in a row. It's not because, oh, I was lucky at that particular time. It's just, that's random variation. In order to know, you need to do statistics. You cannot just eyeball it. However, throughout this paper, they eyeball it and they make conclusions on that all over the place. And I'm just going to give you two examples. Click again. All right, so here's a quote. Survival deteriorates for females between 7 years and 11 years while improving for males during this period. That is a quote from the paper. That is a quote after they say, click, male and female survival estimates are not statistically different. So, just to be clear, they say there is no difference between males and females. Oh, but look, there's a difference it looks like, so let's talk about that as if it's a real thing. And it's not, right? Second, and actually the more disturbing one for me, they say there is a notable deterioration of survival between two years and six years, and therefore they make the recommendation that facilities should avoid separating moms and calves during those ages. However, click, Turns out that if you actually do the statistics there, that two to six year thing is not statistically valid. It is a random bump that they pointed to and looked at and pointed to because it fits their narrative. Okay? It is not statistically different. It's just like that, that bump I showed you in the previous graph. And in fact, if you do look at it, no animals that died in that age range were separated from mom. They are literally just making stuff up. Okay? All right, so that's the third one. Recap. There are, there are more than three, but there are the, these are the top three that, that we're going to talk we had, about. We had to limit it. <laughs> we did. Um, but so, so the, the three take-homes for you guys, first of all, and, and this is actually the one that's the easiest to explain to people, is that there were unequal groups. You can't exclude the young ones from one group and include them in the other group. You can't do that. Second, get yeah, If I can just jump in real quick. Yeah. Even if you include animals that are 30 days older, mm. um, the survivability between wild and captive orcas is, is like comparable. So it's, it, it truly does lower your estimate for orca survivability if you ignore this basic difference that they chose to ignore. So it's, it, it, it's, it's a real problem. Yeah, so, so to be clear, what they should have done is they should have also, since we can't know the data from the wild, so it's not like we're going to recover that. So instead, what you just have to do is use the same methodology for both groups. So you should have not included any of the baby orcas that died before six months. Okay? All right, so that's one. Second, population structure is not the same as survival probability. They're, they're just two different things, um, and it takes time to reach old age. You know, we have a young population, right? The first, if I'm, some, someone correct me, but I believe the first viable birth of orcas in human care was 1985. Does that sound right? Right? So that's not a long time ago. It's going to take time for that population to, um, to get older. And, and third, you can't just pick which data bumps you think are meaningful and then talk about them as if they are. All right, so that's the nutshell version of what's wrong with the Jet Inventor paper. So what can we say? All right, do orcas live longer in the wild? It's still a valid question. And so um, Todd and Kevin Willis, and I don't know who else is on that paper. Mike Scarpuzzi. Mike Scarpuzzi and I think a fourth person. Yes, and I escaped. Do we know? Okay. Well, wh whoever did, there was another paper that was published very recently uh, looking at sea world orcas and comparing them statistically to orcas in the wild. And I want to show you that data so that we can say, okay, well, what can we say? All right. So what you're looking at here are going to be the orca mortality rates for sea world orcas particularly uh, versus those in the wild. And, and the sea world orcas are um, done by is it decade. First it's 20 years, then 15 years, then 15 years. 
One thing I want to point out is that, yeah, you know what, 40, 50 years ago, uh, orca mortality rate in human care wasn't nearly as good as it is now. It was pretty high. However, it has gotten progressively better until today, if you could click again for me, this is the rate we're looking at, and click one more time, this is the wild data. So today, orca mortality rate is just as good as it is in the wild. Okay? No statistical differences.